Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you very much for joining today's uh, meetup with System Change Finland. My name is Arnaldo Pellini, and I'm a researcher and um, international consultant in international uh, development, and um, also a member of System Change uh, Finland, the association which is hosting today's uh, meetup. I mean, together with Dora. We, are, we will kind of facilitate right, and moderate uh, the discussions that we are going to have today with Akansha uh, Bapna, who, Bapna, who will speak uh, to us about a paper that has been produced a so, few months ago, not too long, but which is about making the case for a system approach to attack in low and middle income countries. Just a, a note for all of you who are here, this, um, the meetup is being currently uh, streamed live also uh, on YouTube, and we will have a recording of this uh, meeting that will allow the colleagues and friends who cannot uh, join today, also because of time zones, et cetera, right? Uh, to have the possibility to um, watch it and listen to it uh, later on. Um, let me see how I do. How I move my screen. Okay, this is the touch. Okay, it's working. Everything is working. so good. Um, so as I said, this meetup uh, today is organized and hosted by System Change Finland, and um, which is an association that has been set up. Uh, um, I don't remember now. Exactly, but I think it's a bit more uh, than a year, even though I was part of this initial meeting when it was set up, but I think it's a bit more than a year. And the purpose of the association is to promote the application of approaches that can help people, organization, and society at large to understand and work with systems and complexity. And this series of uh, webinar or meetup uh, that uh, are ongoing, try to bring concrete experiences um, about how to do that, how to work with system, in system, through system, and also with complexity. And the discussion today with Akansha will help us to get some uh, experience uh, about that or hear about that. So Akansha is um, our speaker today uh, and um, I would like just to introduce her briefly to give uh, all of you a little bit of an idea also of her and information about her uh, background. I mean she's uh, <clears throat> speaking from uh, Jodhpur in Rajasthan in India and Akanksha has worked extensively on education in the education sector over the years, bridging the gap between practice, policy, and research. For close to a decade, she has integrated qualitative, quantitative, and mixed method approaches in her work, researching and measuring the impact of education interventions across India, Nepal, countries such as India, Nepal, Tanzania, United States, Colombia, Italy, and Netherlands. Her expertise has been applied to research, design, and evaluation for the work of organizations such as Google, the Pearson Group, the British Council, as well as the Lego, uh, Lego Foundation. In addition to directing impact evaluation, Akanksha has also been advising on strategy for high quality data collection and evaluation, uh, working in close collaboration and in partnership with various states, governments, throughout India. Akanksha holds a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge and a master's degree in international education uh, policy from Harvard University. So Akanksha, very warm welcome and thank you so much for making the time for being here at our meetup. Um, a brief kind of, um, you know, just a couple of, uh, less than a minute, I would say, um, to run through the agenda or at least the suggestion that we have for the flow of our conversation. I mean, I'm at the moment introducing uh, the event. We will have after now, um, I have a couple of more slides, but then we will have a mini group session, which will help um, you to go in small groups and just to maybe uh, get to know each other. I mean, these meetups are called meetups and not webinars also because there are a possibility or a space where 
people, colleagues interested in the topic of system and complexity can come together and a bit also get to know uh, each other. So there will be a, 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 a quick, brief uh, group session um, like that, and Dora will help to uh, establish and organize those breakout rooms. We will then start the discussion with Akanksha, which we have uh, decided to or design it so that I will have uh, for her some some questions about not only you know uh, the paper that she has produced, which gives the title to today's event, but also more broadly on issues around systems and uh, also education system at tech, and also her experiences working in India um, in this area, in this field, and some of her, to try also to get for us at least some of her uh, insights. After that discussion, and which is a little bit in the form of a QA, and uh, we will go back to breakout rooms, either to discuss in small groups the, um, and apologies because the dog is played now with a glass now, so that's why you hear something in the background. The we will go back to breakout rooms either to you know come up with some comments that we may have to what Akanksha has uh, shared with us, which we can then share to the wider group, or it can also be about question or you know question that uh, the discussion with Akanksha has raised and. A question for clarification you you may have and that will lead us to the second part of the meetup and then to the conclusion i think we can now move on to the next part of our program which as i said we have kind of when we discuss about the design for today's meetup we were thinking should akanksha present uh, like in a traditional style or you know with uh, slides about uh, maybe some of her experience, et cetera. And then we kind of decided to have more of a conversational uh, style. As uh, Dora mentioned, which we can start now, Dora mentioned in the chat earlier before the breakout group, that is possible if you have any comments or questions also to use the time now while I will ask some question to Akanksha and hear uh, from her, you, use, you can use the chat function to either put comments or questions which we may take up uh, later on when this part of the meetup is uh, finished. So feel free to comment and share ideas there. So Akanksha, let's start uh, with some of the questions that I was thinking um, as we were, you know, kind of approaching the time for our meetup. And, um, you know, we will go into a little bit the work and the research that you have done for the paper that, as I said, gives the name and the title to today's events. But I think it would be interesting also before we go into that to kind of get a little bit uh, or ask you at least a few questions more to set the scene, a bit of a background, um, et cetera, so that uh, we will that will help us also to lead us right to a little bit the content and the points uh, that we want to discuss or you want to share about the work you have been doing. So I think the first question, given that um, the paper was uh, produced uh, uh, by you being part of um, a development program, a research development program called EdTech Hub. If you can tell us and tell everyone here a little bit more what that uh, program is about uh, its scope, its objectives, and uh, et cetera. I mean, that will help us to give a bit of context where this work, from where sure. this work has emerged. Please, Akash. Thanks, Armando. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. I can hear well. Okay, yeah, great. So, um, so thank you everyone for making the time uh, to join this session today. Um, so I am currently working on this um, large scale program called the EdTech Hub, which has been uh, funded by the UK FCDO as well as uh, the Gates Foundation has been, and is being supported by the World Bank. It is essentially a consortium of a number of partners that include Cambridge University, Overseas Development Institute, and, and uh, two, three others. Um, and the mandate for the EdTech, EdTech Hub is to generate rigorous evidence to try um, and make change at the policy level. Um, currently, we are just embarking, I think after two years of having set up the hub and 
going through all of the, the COVID-related uh, sort of setbacks. Uh, we're embarking on empirical research over the next two to three years um, uh, and undertaking certain fairly large scale studies to try and understand different aspects of education technology. I can go into that a little bit more detail uh, subsequently. Um, we are also operating in, after a lot of review in six countries now, we'll be doing research in Kenya, Tanzania, and East Africa, uh, Ghana and Sierra Leone in West Africa, and uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh and South Asia. Uh, we do have team members on ground as well who are interfacing with governments, uh, which is then going to be helping us to, to talk to policy in parallel with the research. Um, and I would just want to park that point because this is going to come up uh, towards the end of the conversation as well. Uh, and I'll go back to you. Yeah, Akanksha, maybe if you can tell us, uh, I mean, it's a bit of a follow-up question. What's the difference between I mean, it, it, the Attack Up is an international development program, right? It's funded by organizations that fund projects, program in, in middle and low income countries. What's the difference between a program, international development program that does research versus an international development program that, for example, you know, works directly with schools, with ministries, and so on? So what's the difference in terms of scope, purpose, et cetera? So we are not an implementing organization. So we would not be implementing um, ed tech interventions or education interventions um, in any context. Rather, we would be partnering with implementers to try and understand or measure the impact of different types of programs. So for example, if there's a, um, an organization working with personalized learning software to try and teach children in, uh, in Kana, then we would be working with them as research partners, but not as implementation partners. Does that answer your question? Anna? Yeah, thank you, Kanch. Um, and again, I mean, um, anybody can also please feel free to put question, continue to put question in the chat. Uh, we'll get into systems in a second, also because this is a system change Finland meetup, right, Kanch? But uh, let's focus or stop for a moment on this word, which gives also the title to the program you are involved, which is EdTech, because EdTech can mean many, I mean, can mean different things to different people, right? I mean, for someone can kind of, the image that comes to mind could be a computer in a classroom, but there may be also mm -hmm. um, other things. And it's particularly relevant, I think, in this COVID uh, period of time, whereby, you know, in the vast majority, if not all, apart, apart from a few exceptions, countries in the world, at least last year, there was a school closure and therefore big implications and consequences for kids and their education. Um, so, I mean, the question for me is, first of all, what, what is for you a tech? Can you def what is your definition of a tech, particularly in the context of low and middle income countries? And maybe also, can you define, it's possible to even define a tech or it's just not possible and one has to figure out different ways to describe it or think about it? Yeah, so I think uh, the hub went through a fairly deep discussion around what we mean by a tech. Um, you know, in the process of the inception and setting up of the hub. And uh, based on numerous reviews, et cetera, uh, the current definition is technology that is designed for or appropriated for education purposes. And I think um, then the question would be if technology could be digital or non-digital technology. Uh, we're largely looking at digital tech, but not excluding media like radio and television. So for example, uh, an abacus would not be part of the EdTech Hub's purview of education technology, but we are including uh, TV and radio as well. And in terms of education and technology applied to education, we, we would then go from a range of personalized learning software to classroom management systems to um, education management systems at the government level as well and anything in between. Uh, would all be considered under the purview of education technology. I mean, from your work in education, I mean, as I said in the introduction, you work on evaluation of education program with state governments across uh, different parts of India. I mean, when you saw a tech in practice, in action, mm -hmm. how did it look like? What did you see? Um, okay. 
this can be a very long uh, long discussion as well, just based on this. Um, so uh, some of my work when I started in education over a decade ago was with uh, one of the state governments of India. So India is a, is a federal system with 28 states and um, also education is considered as what we call a concurrent subject. So while the central government has broad rules, the state governments can interpret them and implement as they see fit. Um, I was working in one of the Northern Indian states called Haryana. And uh, interestingly, at that point, the administrators were very keen on research uh, evidence-driven policy making. So I was setting up a research team for them. Um, technology was used for many, many purposes. So from um, the, re so the research team was coming from a lot of um, the teaching cadre was brought in to do action-based research. Uh, technology was then used for them to do data collection and data entry, that was one. Uh, in the schools, um, and this is in public schools, we've seen computer uh, computer rooms or computer labs, but invariably a lot of the equipment is protective, protected or locked away because the, the head of the institution is then held responsible in case um, something breaks. So at the risk of um, you know being accountable for that, they just don't end up using that technology. Um, so that has been a very significant problem in just the uptake of, even if we do have access, it's not used. Um, technology was also used for data collection and um, managing the statewide system of schools, uh, which was again very interesting because data is coming in in multiple formats and on demand. So if some of the secretaries of the state required certain pieces of information, they would just send a circular out and everyone was required to drop everything, fill out certain forms, which are then collected and brought back. Very often, this was just collated in a physical file, um, not even digitized. Uh, but at the same time, they did have a lot of digital records as well. So like the tech was very mixed up in how we would then analyze this data to, to make decisions at the policy level. So there's been a whole range of um, the way tech is available, how it is perceived and how it is actually eventually used um, in, in the context, at least of a, a country like India. I mean, the reason I asked that question to go a little bit into you know, also your experience over tech in your work is because I think, and I think your answer kind of helped me is that to show that, or at least to describe, you know, a, a tech as almost a system within an education system. So, which is uh, of course where, where we want to go with the meetup today. But the fact that the tech is applied on different elements or parts of an education system, not only classroom, not only school, but also administrative offices, unit, et cetera. I mean, shows that it can be seen as a system. And so let me, let, or let us now move to this point of system, again, to stay a little bit uh, still at this level of background and context. And I want to share a bit of an experience that I, or an exchange that I had recently. I was working on a concept note for a research proposal on education in uh, low and middle income countries, more of the development of a research idea is not a call, it's not a response to a funder. And so, but just to put ideas together for a small piece of research about the governance of education systems, which actually touches also on a tech. And the concept note has been reviewed by an external researcher, you know, an expert in education who uh, received the paper to kind of give her, uh, is she in this case? to give her opinion to help improving it. And throughout, the, throughout the, the discussion, when we had the back and forth, and at some point also a Zoom call about the comment she had, I wanted, I don't know, I had this instinct to ask her, you know, what do you, what is your idea about, uh, you know, the system thinkings applied to education research or education uh, development and, and development in low and middle income country. And she had an interesting point in her response. She said to me, you know, system thinking is interesting, but it's also very abstract. And I mean, for me, it's, and in fact, her comments to my research idea were moving it away from a system 
kind of lens to the research idea that I had. So I was wondering when I, after the conversation I had with her, and here's my question to you, whether when we speak about systems or this language of system thinking and to some extent complexity, and we spoke in our breakout group now, we just touch on it, right? Uh, may put people off also because you, okay, yeah, there is a system, but then what do we do? So what, I mean, when you think about systems, what comes to your mind? And I guess you wrote a paper about it. So I think you are into system, but also, do you also recognize some of these uh, challenges when we speak about system and the language that goes around it so that it makes it difficult to explain to others how to apply some of those ideas? So um, I think one of the big sort of aha moments we had while writing this paper was also the distinction between a sector and the system. Um, so we have the education sector, which we know has all of its components, etc. But when we then talk about it as a system, we need to then think differently. So, um, so that is one distinction, uh, and we'll maybe I think given this is the Systems Change Finland group, I uh, I guess I wouldn't want to be super explicit here because everyone is coming from some background of of systems. But essentially, when we think about a system, it is a, a set of interconnected elements with some kind of a relational element between them. So there are some sorts of relationships happening uh, between these different elements in a connected um, series of actors. Um, that's going to be a, that's a very simplistic way of putting it and systems then also operate at different levels um, going from micro systems to meso systems exosystems macro systems as well so for example a family unit can be considered as a, a relatively micro system and then a school education system can be considered as a macro system uh, both of these have the commonality of having actors which are connected to each other in some way, have some kind of a dynamic relationship going on within it. The fact that this relationship is dynamic makes it very hard to analyze or predict what is going to be happening. Um, so this then brings in the complex aspect of systems. Um, very often then the next bit of confusion is whether it is complicated or whether it is complex. Um, and again, uh, so <laughs> I was just reading up um, an article which blames Mr. Roger of Roger's desk thesaurus of putting both of these words as synonyms, complex and complicated, and they're not, they don't mean the same. A complicated system or a complicated problem will have a, a designated solution to it, whereas a complex system or a complex problem will not have one single solution or one single way of addressing it. Um, so those are just some of the kind of top of the line ideas to keep in mind when we're thinking about the system and which automatically comes with complexity. Akancha, thank you. So let's, uh, you know, now go a little bit more into the research and that went into the paper that then the EdTech Hub, you have led for the EdTech Hub and the EdTech Hub has publish. Um, I think Dora has shared earlier in the chat the link uh, to that paper here. I think it is, again, if you want to pick it up and download it or have a look at it after uh, the, the meetup of today. Uh, but let's, let's ask or hear from you first what motivated you to number one, put forward the idea of a system paper on the tech, right? Because being a program, one has to pitch ideas and then ideas may be followed up or not. So what motivated you to make that pitch and also to make a suggestion to the, to the program you're involved uh, for a research and a paper on systems and a tech? So there's uh, a few things. I think one is a slightly more sort of historical background as to where I come from. And secondly, the problem that we're now looking at. Um, in terms of the historical part, so as I'd mentioned, I was working one, with one of the state governments when I started my work in education, and uh, I was trying to set up a research team for them. I had moved in from into education from a science background, working in a lab for about 13 years prior to that. And just coming from such a controlled environment to something where everything was available at all given times, it was just mind-boggling to try and make sense of it. 
and particularly understanding the Indian education system and its problems. Um, so we were talking at this at the same time in parallel about we need to have a curriculum change to bring about change. We need to be training teachers differently. We need to redefine the role of the teacher. We need to be assessing children. We need to be changing policy at this. And at that time, it just felt like this tank with very many leaks and you plugged one and another one leaked and you know it was just didn't know how to handle it. At that time, I also did not have the language or the un understanding of uh, systems and complexity to, to start making sense of it. Um, and over time, uh, as I was doing more and more research and evaluations, also realized that um, a lot of the education research, so my, my work has largely been in evaluations and impact assessments. Um, so understanding that a lot of the research that is out there is being analyzed by economists. And what that tends to do is take a complex problem like education, something like, you know, giving a textbook should improve learning outcomes. But there is a black box in the middle, which has a lot of things going on, which will lead to that output. But the regression equations we're using are always linear or at the most quadratic. So excessively simplifying a problem at some point started standing out as an issue in, in understanding education itself. And at this time, I was also undertaking research just which was non-commissioned just out of our own curiosity to um, to see if we could map out uh, education systems uh, and the complex aspects of it. So what we did was we downloaded um, all of the EDIC database, so 1.6 million research articles, and used natural language processing to try and come up with a network of all of the elements connected within education. Um, so we managed to distill it down after training some of the data to uh, just about, well, not just about, about 5,000 nodes and a multiplier of uh, edges or connections between them. But even at that point, this research stopped at seeing this as a static structure of like a three-dimensional network structure. I think what has been added recently to my understanding is that the structure is not static. And again, that has been a big sort of aha moment. And then the con con concepts of complexity and emergence have then been added to this repertoire of language and on systems and networks as well. So that's sort of been the evolution of, of thinking in, in this way. I can now not think without thinking in three dimensions. Um, so that has been, <laughs> been both an advantage and disadvantage because it's, it's often difficult to explain um, why you're thinking in such complex ways. Um, so that's where this is coming from. And I started working with the EdTech Hub just about a year ago uh, when we were trying to make sense of our portfolio and our work going ahead. Um, and the questions around what is EdTech were still sort of fresh, uh, freshly being hotly debated. And, how do we think about ed tech? Is that, is that a, an, a system in itself? Is technology an add-on to education? Um, how do they, they interact with each other? And then coming across a lot of research which uh, highlighted the complexity of ed tech. So um, even a single kind of intervention does not give you the same results. So something as straightforward as giving access to a device um, will lead to different kinds of learning outcomes based on gender, based on whether it's in school, out of school, what the backgrounds of the children are, what country you're working in, how this device has been given. So just a simple input can lead to so many kinds of, of, um, of outputs and outcomes. Secondly, the scalability of edtech, while it looks very obvious and given you know, organizations like Google have gone to such massive scales, it seems straightforward. But in terms of edtech, it's not just scaling in numbers, um, it is also scaling in outcomes and how it is being used. So the, the context then constantly plays into the scalability. So there's a lot of challenges there. The causal pathways to outcomes are not really very well defined. And then therefore this leading to the thinking that something different needs to be done uh, in order to be able to understand this problem. Uh, in parallel, there has been some work over the last few years, which has been done by DFID on um, systems approaches and systems thinking as well. So that also uh, fed into some of our thinking and therefore uh, we decided to work on this paper. I will just type in what is DFID in the chat. 
I can't, I mean, before, I mean, the next question, which is about how did you go about the research? I mean, can you give a sense of the scale of the education system in India? I mean, more or less. Um, so how India many children are in school or maybe also if you know out of school? So uh, over time, the out of school numbers have reduced quite significantly. We have about 1.5 million government schools, um, which is about 60% of the overall school population, uh, school numbers in India. So about the, depending on the state, it's between 30 to 40% of private schools. Um, and even within the private schools, we have uh, the high income schools, which we consider as the ones which spend or which charge above what the states spend per month on a child. Um, that is a very small percentage, so only about six to seven percent schools charge over government expenditure or as how the government defines expenditure that in itself is a whole different discussion. Um, and the remaining about 93 to 94 percent schools are uh, they charge below that. Within that, also, we then have schools which are uh, registered versus non-registered. So India passed the Right to Education Act in 2010, which then was supposed to go to full implementation by 2013. And under that, all of the unregistered schools were either to be shut down or to improve their infrastructure so that they could then apply for being registered. Um, a lot of them did get upgraded, but many um, schools still exist, which are, are not registered fully and are under the radar. Um, but that, that number has reduced quite significantly. Complex system, I would say, right? There's yes. many variable moving parts. How many students, more or less? Um, over 400 million students. Yeah. So this is just to give the scale, right? Of, yeah. of the system. So uh, one, the state I was working in, uh, Haryana, for example, is about half the number of uh, children in all of Germany. And uh, that's a, a median sort of a state. So some states are, are bigger, some are smaller, but yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you. So uh, you were in, in the journey that you describe about how did you, also you came to the idea to suggest for the hub, this research and paper. You describe sometimes the challenges, right? To to get the uh, how do you say not a yeah, grip of the system or a complex system in terms of even collecting data, analyzing, and doing the research. So, how did you approach the research for this particular paper? So, about edtech and system. What did you plan, and uh, how did it go? So, uh, it really did not go according to plan. To be very honest. Uh, because we just kept uncovering things as we went along. Firstly, just wrapping our heads around over 80 years of systems research was quite mind boggling. Um, and just trying to tease out what we needed to understand, instead of spending a lifetime trying to understand that at this point, uh, was a bit of a challenge. But I think uh, we did eventually manage to get some grip of how this thinking evolved and, you know, what what systems thinking is versus what systems theories are. And then another the question that you posed at the beginning and also through the writing of the paper, the so what? So what if it's a systems approach? What do we do? What is different about it? I think the so what was one of the hardest questions to answer. Um, and yeah, why do we need a systems approach in the first place? So uh, the why we need a systems approach piece uh, then took us on a little bit of a digression from writing a theoretical paper um, to actually analyzing some information. And I can do a, a quick presentation of um, what I mean by that. Uh, Please do. Yeah. yeah. So basically we're looking at, um, you know, we made a case that EdTech is a, is a complex system and we need to be moving away from just a very simplistic or a linear or circular way of thinking to something which is more connected and, and interdependent. So that was something that we had established. And uh, what we ended up doing to try and understand, and one of the other reasons we undertook this is when we recognize that EdTech is complex um, and how we're analyzing it right now is insufficient, we that came from us trying to collate um, a number of edtech frameworks that we were looking at. 
So the EdTech frameworks, for example, will tell you how to implement EdTech in a classroom, which operates one at you know, a single level or a micro level within the EdTech system. It also only takes into account very few of the stakeholders. So, so just teachers and students, for example. Uh, whereas the influences around them um, have not been included in, in this implementation model. Similarly, different EdTech frameworks operate around different aspects of the education and technology interface, uh, but they don't look at the system as a whole. So that was something that we found was a little bit um, in, incomplete in its connections. Um, and what we did is we then ended up qualitatively analyzing all of the papers that were describing these uh, at tech framework. So there are certain limitations to this methodology that we have undertaken, but it does make a case in point. Um, and we essentially identified all of the connections between the nodes or the elements, which we've defined uh, as the stakeholders within the education and edtech system. And we coded for the kinds of relationships or how many times they were occurring together within these frameworks. Um, and we coded both for frequency and also the type of relationship. So whether uh, the, the data or the codes uh, identified a power dynamic or a responsibility or some kind of a resource flow. So a stakeholder analysis of all of the um, edtech frameworks that we could find, uh, which is about 17 of them. And um, we analyzed those using these uh, codes. What we found was, um, one thing which emerged, which was not easily visible within um, a traditional two-dimensional or qualitative way of analyzing is, uh, while it's evident that policymakers would be an important part of any system, employers appear to be a very critical node right after policymakers. And in our traditional qualitative analysis, there is no way we could have made this interpretation. Um, what we did is we then used uh, social network analysis to analyze this coded data and employers are then emerging as a key node because they are linked to accreditation bodies um, and they are the only link to these. So all of the other stakeholders need to kind of access the employer node to get to the accreditation bodies. Um, and this is an interesting insight because employers can then be used as a leverage point for actually bringing about a significant change in the system. If they are demanding certain kinds of accreditation mechanisms um, or certain kinds of standards, uh, then there could be system level change being brought about via the accreditation bodies as well. Uh, so this was a very interesting insight uh, that emerged from this uh, paper. Arnaldo, I will send this back to you to do any kind of a follow-up question? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, we already talked about some of the key findings and soon we will go into breakout room for a, you know, a quick reflection by the team. The other thing that I notice here from these slides that you have on um, this network kind of image, uh, Akanksha, uh, because you are a researcher, I am sometimes researcher, sometimes consultant, but let's say I am a researcher, is how peripheral <laughs> how the researchers and as you described in the beginning the tech hub is a research project but from this image here the influence or the interaction that researchers have on policy decision in education and particularly on tech seems to be very limited so was it something you expected or was this an unexpected finding no so this was a bit unexpected and also uh, something which has been a bit of an existential finding uh, for the hub because um, how, yeah, researchers clearly appear to be on the fringes, at least based on this network graph and, and our analysis. As I mentioned at the beginning, this methodology has limitations, but it is making the case in point that this is an interesting method or approach uh, to undertake to try and understand systems in a different light. But yes, it definitely would make us think, particularly as I stated up front that you know, we're generating evidence to influence policy. Uh, we should definitely think a little bit more deeply about how this is going to be happening. Um, so yes, this has been a, a big sort of insight that has been thrown up uh, for us to rethink our strategies on how to influence policy. It makes me think as well <laughs> about my own work. <laughs> 
I'm anxious. Thank you so much. Is there something else you would like to highlight uh, about the findings? Uh, and um, then we can go um, in the breakout. Room. Yeah, maybe not about the findings, but I would just want to add one more from the challenges part of thinking through this paper. I think um, it took us a little while to parse the purpose of systems approaches. Um, so one is, you know, systems thinking approaches, theories, and there are over 40 to 50 systems theories as well. Um, how do we select what theory to apply for what kind of um, what kind of an analysis or what kind of an area of work? So that is one question. And we, we've written a little bit about that in the paper as well. Uh, but I think also the question of why systems approaches. So, uh, you know, you could be using them for purposes of evaluation for management, for, or for implementation, as well as for research. And with each of those, there would be different kinds of methods associated and what you would actually do to, uh, to understand the system from that perspective. So I just want to leave it at that because that was definitely a point of confusion for us in why, even if we do adopt a systems approach, like how do we link ed tech and ed tech system to a systems approach? So that was another thing that took us a little while to to parse and clarify as well. I think we, we follow a bit of a sequence. Uh, I will report a little bit back from the discussion we had in our group, uh, but I think let's follow a bit the chronology. And uh, uh, Rohit, do you want to share your questions? I cannot see if you're still here, but I, I guess you are. Uh, the question that you put earlier on about ed tech and also the non-digital aspect. So that we, you know, we respond to that or Akanksha responds to that. Please, Rohit. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, when we define technology very specifically to digital technology, and that includes TV, radio as well, because they are digital as well. But the point is there are like many, many manipulation of objects uh, which child do in an early age. And those manipulation now it's been proven from last 20, 30 years research repeatedly that are essential for children's development. So I just wonder like when we focus too much on digital ad tech activities, we give a very narrow definition of technology, which is very computer or chip centric to the next generation in some sense. So even for the drawing, they have to do the drawing on let's say iPad, or even for the coloring, they have to do the coloring uh, on some boards or do the reading on Kindle and so on. So I was just wondering like, what's your view about expanding this definition of technology and not only a Beskus, but also a stick. The stick is a very good example of a technology if you can explain it so. And that gave a broader example for students that how to think, uh, more broadly about uh, innovation and tool making. So I just wondered like how you think about that. I think uh, one of the things that has happened particularly in light of the pandemic is that we are definitely assuming technology to be digital technology because it's also become much harder for children to physically interact with each other. Um, and I think hopefully this definition will evolve over time. But I also think that the EdTech Hub Put its definition down of technology in the midst of the pandemic and therefore it has a fairly narrow scope. I think also from a research point of view, if we don't restrict it a little bit, then we, we could be researching anything from Lego bricks to, to sticks and physical play as well. So I think just also to keep our research very focused, that is the case. Um, I think that your question has two aspects to it. So the, the role of play and physical play, um, all of that is absolutely cru crucial. There is no, no doubt about it. And if you look at the work the Lego Foundation has done, then you know there's a lot that's being said and across the board, um, particularly in early childhood, zero to five, zero to six is, is very important. So there's no replacement of that as such. Um, the other side of it is we have this technology. It does not need to be um, the end. It is a means to be able to do what you would not be able to do otherwise. So I think uh, that is another thought to keep in mind when we're thinking about ed tech. And yes, technology can be defined in very many ways, uh, but at some point we, we will have to take a call on where we scope it out. So. 
does that respond to your point right yeah and i think the point that for research you have to focus on some specific definition that is something which uh, i agree to yeah this this makes a lot of sense but i will given that we are talking systems um i think analo you we've had these discussions like having a a an a sort of narrow definition of something kind of goes against the grain of thinking thinking in systems but otherwise we would also keep going around in loop and and systems thinking does take us away from you know just uh analyzing interaction between two entities in depth and ignoring everything else uh but i think yes yeah, so this is definitely the dichotomy of the depth versus holding the ambiguity and then even trying to understand it in both ways so that's where the whole confusion within this whole systems thinking comes from thank you akanksha um rohit uh, i i know that in the chat there is a second question you have about the visualization of system and then dora has posted the question before we go on to those uh, and also hear from the the other breakout group let me just share what the key point that have emerged from the breakout discussions also to give akanksha uh, a chance to reflect or respond to that so there were i think a couple of points that emerged um, yeah i guess there are a mix of question and comments the first is uh, the interesting point um and you know this was shared by mayor vilina and paul as well which is the following you know the relationship within the system between let's say the human part of the system or the social part of the system to so the individuals right of the education system and so on is of course a key part of an education system which tech comes in but it's important also to think reflect research and understand the relationship that exists between the social part of the system so the, let's say the element of the system which are people essentially and then the technology solution that are inserted there so the the web and the fabric of relationship is not just between individual but also with with technology the technology part now the question is what are the implications what does that mean a second uh, comments which also turned then in the question from lena was the following she was uh kind of interested in something akancha said earlier which is about 50 different ways or theories to look at system and then you know how do you pick and choose do you need to know i guess and follow up lena what you said i mean do you need to learn them all in depth etc and then understand them all to be able to choose which one is more useful in different contexts circumstances or research or analysis question so akancha when you heard these two type these two comments or slash question what came to your mind so maybe i can just kind of expand what we spoke about already in terms of yes so there has been there are over 40 50 different systems theories that are out there um they are all applicable to different system types um and systems do have different characteristics as well so the soft systems hard systems social systems etc and based on the characteristics then the appropriate kinds of theories need to be selected the education system or the edtech system becomes a little complicated i guess complex or complicated uh because it has two types so there's the, the tech part of it which is a hard system and then there is the education part of it which consists of human interaction that for a soft system so how do we if we were to define a theory for the edtech system how would you go about selecting that is one question uh but so far uh, the systems work that has been done around education has centered um, around three theories largely which is the general systems theory evolving then into the ecological systems theory and currently the thinking is being advocated for complex systems theory which also seems to make the most sense as there is the concept of emergence so basically that you know the whole is more than the sum of its parts um and how how things interact completely may have a different kind of outcome of the system as well um so uh, there there's actually a really nice um, book which has been written on making this case and i can share a link with dora um, at a later point uh, on complexity thinking in education as well so these are the the three theories which have been so far generally used to address education so well, there is already a bit of a possibility to focus zoom in yeah, to some yeah, of those yeah. without getting lost in the 
40, 50, which might take a lifetime to, <laughs> yeah. to get to know. Um, I would like to hear now uh, from the other group, any comments or questions or summary of comments or questions you have discussed. And I'm also aware for Rohit, you have a second question in the chat and then we may then close with the question that Dora has posed. So any of you who was in the other breakout room who would like to, to share, uh, please. Feel yeah, free to, to unmute yourself. Yeah. Christoph or Mariam, would you like to go? I'm already speaking a lot. <laughs> um, go ahead, Christoph. <laughs> oh, well, the only, uh, I'm still wrapping my hair, head around yeah. systems. So like the first, definitely the biggest outcome of this meetup is that I'm really looking forward to reading the whole paper and then uh, hopefully I'll be in a better position to comment. But what I'm wondering right now, because I'm mostly interested in like workplace learning and adult learning is that whether there are any kind of specifics you think would be like good to mention in for this kind of context as compared to, for example, well, formal education. So, Actually, complexity has been addressed in the management literature a fair amount. So if you're thinking about workplace learning um, and you know, improving practices, then systems thinking have been applied quite a bit to those problems as well. Um, I have not gone into too much detail on the kinds of theories that are being used, but you can definitely find a lot of literature. I think I might be able to share some as well in that area. And also, Christoph, to reassure you, I mean, we are all wrestling with these ideas. And even so, our country has produced this paper. I'm pretty sure she's also still <laughs> wrestling with most, many of these ideas. So we are all, everyone is in the same boat, right? Uh, Mariam or Rohit, I'm, I'm calling also Rohit because you have the question in the chat. But if there is anything, a comment or a question, you, uh, uh, Mariam, you're welcome to do it. Yeah. Uh, actually, my question is kind of, was kind of answered previously by Akanksha, when she, in her last talk, she was saying that uh, one question to, to, to have is that, where, what is the type of theory is for this data or for this analysis? Because I'm in that stage, so I am a bit uh, confused or I'm doubt, skeptical of how to choose the theory and how to choose how it, it's proper or not for any, the type of data that I have. So that was a question for yes. me. Uh, Marian, then maybe, I don't know, Kanksha, I mean, I put forward a suggestion, maybe uh, there is a possibility also, Marian, to, to link up directly with Akanksha. I mean, this is a meetup after all, right? It's not a lecture or anything like this. So uh, maybe there is a possibility to share here emails also in the chat, etc. Is that okay, Marian? I, I was writing in the chat. Yes, yes, sure. Definitely. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Rohit, your second question, and then we have Dora. Yeah, uh, in, in that part, I was wondering about communicating this system approach to people, so to general people in, because I come from this science education background, science communication group here in TU Delft. So it's always like how I communicate my research to larger audience. And this one challenge when we think about complex system or take an approach of system thinking, one challenge is visualizing the outcomes or the results and make it digestible to others. So most of the time these visualization, because in my masters I work on that, uh, how we use multimodal data in education and how to visualize it. And uh, one thing common was we have such nice visualization, colorful visualization, dynamic visualization, 3D, 4D, whatever you can call those. But the end goal of them, which is to understand the complex uh, theory is not being achieved by those. So as much beautiful the visualization is, that much complex it is to understand. That is what my understanding is. 
So being on that preview, how you go on to visualize these system approach to larger audiences. That's a very good point, uh, Rohit. And I mean, let alone larger audiences, we are even struggling to explain this within our own research team. Um, <laughs> So uh, we've been, uh, we, we were tasked with working on systems, but I think at some point it, it, it has become this vague abstract thing, which is not really uh, being taken up. But, um, and this will actually talk to Dora's question as well, uh, which is what kinds of questions you could recommend adding a systems lens to. Um, it could be a whole variety, but right now as a very concrete example, we are undertaking some research to understand the, teacher allocation problem in Sierra Leone. And uh, as part of that, one of the questions we are asking is, how is data currently being collected and utilized and how is decision-making happening within the education system for teacher allocation? So we will be studying all of the interactions across stakeholders, the data flows, information flows, resource flows, et cetera, and that, there is no other way for us to think about analyzing it other than using systems methodologies to do so. So um, those are the kinds of questions we will be using, but, but then making that in a manner which the policymaker can actually understand is going to be quite a challenge. I think it will have to be um, brought to a, a sim very simple consumption. I think even being presented linearly, even though it has been using in the background approaches like this is saying, you know, these are your top stakeholders who are the main influencers. This is what you need to be telling them to do. So um, we don't necessarily have to present a 3D or a 4D piece of information in the same number of dimensions, but it can be simplified as well to be presented. And we'll, I think we will require some experience. We haven't done that yet. And yes, we are currently in the process of struggling with communicating this uh, even within the team. Thank you, Kancha. We have a hands up. I think it's Dora. And yeah, we I, have a comment from Paula. Please, Dora. Yeah, I was just wondering that when we are talking about systems thinking, right, we are talking about systems that behave over a period of time in a certain way. So I'm just, maybe I'm also answering my own question, but anyways, uh, just a comment that probably I would try to use this uh, to problems that are either recurring or has been kind of for a long time in the making and have found no solution to it. So that might be an indication that you are trying to address the problem too linearly. Hence, there hasn't been no solution. If that um, makes sense. I, I think just, uh, I'm just gonna push that a little bit because sure. Um, for example, we did not know the structure of DNA for a very long time and we got the right kind of technology and we managed to get a diffraction pattern and interpret that. So just because a problem is unsolved for an extended period of time does not mean it requires a complex um, or a, a systems way of thinking to solve it. Maybe we just don't have the right tools at that point in time to address it. So it needs to be a combination of the problem type um, as well as, yes, the when you're saying that systems together then behave in a certain way, yes, that would then be an indication of the fact that there are many, many elements which are interacting, which need to be understood at the same time in order to be able to address that problem. So I would put more emphasis on that fact rather than the, the time lengths or the, yeah. It's okay, Dora. Yeah, and perhaps another one. Uh about what, what uh, Rohit was saying, like how to simplify. I suppose when, once you kind of take a, a, a systems lens and, and you are able to see the complexity, you know, and it becomes even bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But after a, after a while, you are able to kind of pick out the relevant connections that you can zoom back in on. Yes. So um, simplifying it that way, that you actually know which one to focus on out of the mess. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's got to be the zoom out and zoom in um, kind of approach happening uh, in, a, in a pretty continuous manner. Great. Uh, Paula, you want to speak to the comments you put in the chat? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, 
in my own research, I have been I have been not using any particular uh, systems or complexity theory, but I have used both of those ways of thinking, kind of a, as an analytical tool or analytical lens for understanding uh, the phenomenon that I'm studying, kind of finding the new ways of thinking, and I, I found that. Zooming in and out approach really useful when when we are dealing with uh, complex uh, issues and complex phenomena. So yeah, that's that was a good point, excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Akanksha, comments or um, no, not, zoom not in, at the moment. <laughs> Let's continue to zoom in and zoom out <laughs> on system and continue to explore the way to understand system I understand not just uh, with the limitation that as humans we have right because we can't grasp grasp the complexity often i think yeah this and this folding of the ambiguity for an extended period of time is what makes systems thinking uncomfortable for for a lot of uh people so that's something uh, talking to rohit like how do we simplify the idea even um so that it, it spreads further it's a very good question thank you so much is there any final comments or question by any of you we have a few minutes before we'll close dora yeah uh, i was wondering if uh, because you are focusing on uh, low and middle income countries in your research uh, but both you and, and arnaldo have been in this scene for for quite some time so i'm just wondering is there anything from your findings um, or implications that could be like useful or applicable in uh, in high income countries as well. Oh, absolutely. So, if the network graph that I had um, shown earlier, that is actually coming from uh, frameworks which are not context specific. In fact, that was one of the uh, back and forth that Arnaldo and I were constantly having, saying how how are we going to put the context into this network graph. Um, so that is fairly agnostic. It's just coming from research. Um, so that's one point. Secondly, any, you know, any education system, if you look at it, if you just want to narrow focus, even in Finland, for example, if we had to bring about a, a reform, it would require many, many moving parts. And uh, you would have to think in three dimensions in order to be able to find those right levers for change. Um, so the, the approach is definitely applicable across any kind of context. Uh, we are in fact now for the first time trying to make the applications in a low middle income country context through our empirical research. Um, but yes, the application would be pretty much universal. Thank you, Akanksha. So I think if I just ask the question again, any other comments or final, we still have a couple of minutes if I just wait for a few seconds, otherwise we can go to a close. I don't see hands, okay, fine. Then uh, let me just do the thing we always do at the end of this meetup, which is sharing the screen. And number one is showing you that, uh, you know, System Change Finland is there, there is a platform, there is Facebook, Twitter, Slack channel, so please, join us if you want to join uh, the association otherwise also follow us that's also okay because <laughs> from through the social media you can get the information about what happens the event that are organized and some of the discussion that you're going but you can also become a member which helps also uh, expand the platform and the platform is there to organize as we're doing today meetup like this where we share some experiences or knowledge around systems, complexity, etc. So this was the thing I had to do at the end so I can stop sharing. Um, and I would like number one to thank very much uh, Dora for helping and work together. I mean, this was a team effort from the two of us to come up and design and think about the meetup today. So Dora, thank you so much uh, for uh, for contributing, yeah, working on this together. I mean, this was worked really well. Second, thank you, of course, to Akanksha. Thank you so much for making the time and also, uh, yeah, and making the time for this and the interest in sharing with uh, True System Change Finland and the association 
some of your work, but not just the paper. So I think we went also a bit broader looking at some of your experiences and a little bit touch on the India content. And thank you, number three, is for all of us, for all of you who join and make time today. Uh, I mean, this will be then also available as a video. So hopefully other people interested in system complexity and system change field will access this event online 